hey, I'm, hmm. all right. So I'm Gwen Talios and I'm a hybrid writer. Um, and what I mean by that is I mean, I have been both um, independently published my work and then I've also had other people publish it for me, um, mainly through small presses and also um, short story markets, uh, podcasts, that type of thing. So I have experience kind of on both sides of it. Um, I'm a varied writer, so I do write across genres. I write across age groups as well. So I have done um, very adult spicy things and then all the way through middle grade novels, different pen names, <laughs> of course. Um, but that's why I am also actively managing two pen names here. And kind of like what I mentioned before when everyone was coming in, um, Today, we're really gonna kind of identify the steps that you need in order to get publication out the door um, and then options for different levels of investment. So that shoestring kind of understanding of how to publish balanced time is money. Um, and that's so for really once you get your, your author business kind of up and running. And then that live demonstration where we're hoping to build a cover and then actually publish through a publisher called Draft to Digital. Um, didn't want to say just straight up, if you have no budget, you're going to be doing more work. Um, so if you don't have the money, then it's the sweat, sweat equity that you will be having to put into your project here. Um, but at the end of the day, there's really only three steps to self-publishing. One is you have to polish the prose of your project. Um, two, you have to build the book, which is tends to be what trips people up the most. And then um, market your masterpiece if you want to, um, if you have that business mindset of growing your sales. Not everyone has that. So um, so just to dive into polishing your prose here, actually writing the story, that's what this is. Um, and so before you can publish your book, you know, you have to have the book to begin with. Um, and so just at the very basic level, what technology people can use in order to write that book to begin with, if you haven't done that yet. From the shoestring point of view, um, there's Google Docs, OpenOffice, YWriter, Notes, Notepad. They tend to be free software um, that you can even use in a web browser or it's coming preloaded onto your computer when you buy it. Um, many people, including myself, uh, write with Microsoft Word, which is actually one of those time is money options because Word is an expensive word processing software. It is $70 a year for the subscription or $150 to download the entire Microsoft suite. Most people already have it because they bought it for other reasons than just writing. Um, but do you know that from a word processing standpoint, it is one of the more expensive ones. Um, also on that high end of word processors, you have Noveler, um, which is both a month and a year subscription and Atticus. Atticus is a brand new um, processing software that's come out and it's both for writing your novel, but also will help you format. That's why it's kind of a little pricey too. Um, in that balanced option for people who are looking for it, you have Scrivener. That's also a very, um, favorite software of a lot of writers. There's a lot of interesting features there in terms of plotting. A plotter is another example of a software people like. So $25 a year or 99 for a lifetime subscription of that software if you're interested. Um, do you want to shout out if you're like worried about budgeting here, joining NaNoWriMo. So NaNoWriMo, if you don't know, is National Novel Writing Month. It happens every year in November. There's a lot of events that happen where we're encouraging each other to write a novel. Um, I co-lead a region and we usually have events with the Glen Ellen Public Library anyways. So like every Monday night, we're all writing for like four hours. It's great. Um, but one of the nice things about joining NaNoWriMo is you also tend to get a lot of discount codes for participating. So um, it's not uncommon for Scrivener, for example, to have a 50% discount code um, if you're joining that program. And so people tend to use those pretty well. Um, once you have your book, of course, you have to edit it. This is something that probably requires a bit more work and, um, than everyone is familiar with. From the shoestring option, there's critique groups, critique partners, um, the tools that come in your word processing software. So like spell check on Word, for example. Um, critique groups and critique partners are your friends, library group, um, libraries tend to have groups as well. Um, I know there's a few local um, Chicago groups that will have a subset of people who end up doing critiques for each other. Um, so that's definitely something there. Um, from the balanced option, you're getting more into software again. 
So having an edited book is important if you want people to continue and to read through it, especially nowadays, uh, Kindle Unlimited or Scribd, or what ends up happening is people don't have to buy your book. They just have a subscription and then they read through it and you get paid per page. Um, if you want people to read through your entire book, it should be well edited and it should be an engaging story. Um, so at the very least, you should be having copy edits done. Software that can help you with that are ProWritingAid, Grammarly, and Autocrit. Um, ProWritingAid can be kind of expensive. It's about $80 a year or $400 for a lifetime subscription. Um, Grammarly does have a free version, um, but for Pro, it's $144 a year. And then Autocrit is another one, and that's about $300 a year for the Pro version. Personally, I use a combination of the pro version of free writing aid and the free version of Grammarly. Um, and thanks to NaNoWriMo, I actually ended up getting a really good deal. I got a lifetime um, subscription to pro writing aid for $150. Um, so those discounts can be kind of, you know, pretty, pretty steep. I did also buy that a few years ago. Um, there are such things as content editors. So these are people that you would hire to edit your story. And that's going to help you with the developmental edits. So these are who you would hire to say, hey, help me out if my character's motivations are clear. Do I need to put more foreshadowing in a mystery? Um, does the setting make sense? Does the ending have a good resolution? Those type of things, it's gonna be really hard for a technology to pick up like pro writing aid or Grammarly. So you're hiring a person to do that. That's going to run you roughly 200 to $600 per book. That's why this really is kind of that balanced option and why many people tend to go just for the editing software first. If you have um, a lot more money, a lot of people tend to do both the editing software and several different person um, in-person editors. So you have someone who do that copy edit and then you also, or that content edit, and then you have someone who will do the copy edit. So looking at that nitpicky sentence structure. Um, so this is something that you can do for free, but then you're putting in that lot of effort um, and it does depend on the quality of your critique partners, um, or you can kind of put in that, that money for a software or a professional editor to do your book. Um, like I said before, I use Pro Writing Aid, and this is just kind of a screenshot of how that looks. So you can see the type of um, understanding that you can get here. So it does your very basic like grammar and style checkers, thesaurus, but then it also helps you figure out what paragraphs might have slow pacing. So especially if you're writing like a thriller novel, you don't want to have a string of three or four slow pacing paragraphs. It's gonna bog down your reader. And so Pro Writing Aid will tell you, here's where they are, here's where you can break it up. They'll also help you with um, spelling consistency. I know one of my personal problems is I tend to switch between British and American English. Um, so for example, um, having someone walk backwards with that S is the UK spelling, without the S is the US spelling. And so trying to be consistent throughout a novel is very hard. I'll have Pro Writing Aid find that for me. Pro Writing Aid is also very good at picking out um, sticky sentences. So usually those with a lot of prepositions and so it's bogged down, you have to read it a lot of times. We'll also be able to tell you if you're writing for children or if you're writing for nonfiction, they'll give you grade levels, um, kind of that fleece, um reading scale. So like this is a very complex piece of work. This is a simple piece of work, depending on what you're looking for. Um, one of the other things that's nice about Pro Writing Aid is um, you could switch it. So it's not just for creative writing. You could switch it for business writing, for technical writing, for web writing, because they all have slightly different styles and breakouts and audiences. So that's one of the cool things that you could do here. Um, very good at picking out your words and how to make your prose a little faster, a little smoother, um, and getting rid of all of your was and filler words. Um, and that, oh. So, all right, so any questions from like the writing standpoint and the editing standpoint? Nope, okay, we'll get into the bulk of this. So how to actually build your book in order to publish it. Um, step one is to create your cover, obviously. Um, so your novel needs to stand out and it needs to look pretty. And 
there's quite a little a bit of research that actually goes into cover creation. You shouldn't make a cover just because it looks pretty to you. Um, you should also be aware of what the covers are for other books in your genre. Um, I know they say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but people do all the time. And if you find that, let's say you're writing a romance book and all the romance books that have come out in the past two years have that kind of illustrated cover that you can see nowadays versus like the, the old Fabio romances. Well, if you have a Fabio type of cover, then people aren't gonna buy it because they're gonna buy something that looks a little more modern and fits their sensibilities. Um, in some cases where you're writing in, in niche genres, um, so like fantasy is really big, and then you have different types of fantasy. You have the epic fantasy, you have the urban fantasy, you have the um, fantasy kind of based off of medieval Europe. All of those also have very slight differences in covers. Um, so you wanna be aware of what are the current trends before you even start making yours. And you could really just do that by doing a few searches on Amazon or even Goodreads. Um, if you want to make your cover yourself and you're perfectly well, well um, welcome to do so, there's a few options. Canva and Bookbrush tend to be the big ones that a lot of authors use. Um, Paint.net is another one, so is GIMP. GIMP, um, also Inkscape are, you could say Photoshop alternatives. So they have that same type of um, flexibility and complexity in making images, but they have really steep learning curves. Canva and Bookbrush don't, which is why they tend to be frequently used by a lot of authors when they're developing their covers. Um, Kitra is another um, option that falls into there. Um, the balanced option for this could be pre-made covers. So a lot of graphic designers will just make a cover and they're like, whoever wants to buy it can buy it. They'll do slight adjustments. They'll usually put your name in there. They'll put the title of your book, um, but you can't say anything else. You can't say, I want to change the font. I want to change the character in there. I want to change the lighting. It's pretty much as you're seeing it. Those can run from $25 to $250. It depends on the graphic designer. Um, Googling book graphic designers is a good way to find them or in a lot of actually author Facebook groups. Someone is always willing to recommend their graphic designer. Um, you can do Canva Pro and Bookbrush Pro. Um, so it's roughly $12 a month for either of them. And what happens with a pro subscription is you get more advanced editing abilities. You get the ability to download different dimensions and quality of images. You also get access to a huge um, array of templates and images that you could use in commercial items like book covers. Um, so then you wouldn't have to pay per royalty for an image. So what you can do, let's say you make a, a, a book cover in Canva and you have a background image and a model that you really like, you probably have to pay one to $2 to use that in your book cover unless you have a pro subscription, then it's just included um, in your monthly fee, the rights for that. Um, if you have the money for it, um, get a custom cover. Um, so that could start you at 350 but it can go all the way up to $1,000. Um, so <laughs> covers are probably the most expensive part of your book, depending on the length. Um, if you have a really chunky epic fantasy, your editor costs can also be a couple thousand. They tend to charge for word. Um, so, but because covers are how a lot of readers are actually judging the books that they're going to buy, it's worth the investment. Many people will actually say they'll put more money into a cover than they will in hiring a, a content editor and they'll rely on beta readers a little bit more. Um, from, uh, if you also go with a custom cover, it's not uncommon for artists to kind of give you bulk pricing on things. If you say, hey, can you create a cover for both the ebook, the paperback and the audiobook? If that's something you wanna do, it'll just be a lower price per unit. Sometimes they'll also do social media um, images for you if you work with them. Um, that is less likely to come with the pre-made covers, but in Canva and Bookbrush, you can actually make your own social media promo images as well, if that's something that you want to do. Um, so here are cover examples that you can see. Um, so these are a variety of things. Um, the one over here on the left is actually a cover that I made in Canva. Um, so a variety of elements, um, and I was able to actually animate it in Canva. I have an example later, so I could use that for social media. 
Um, Tomorrow and Beyond is also a cover that I created in Canva. Um, the image is actually something that I created with an AI generation and then I just tailored it in Canva. Um, and then Stranded is actually the cover from a group anthology that I contributed to. Um, an author's husband had a photograph that he had um, allowed us usage for and then the text um, had been added in paint <laughs> straight up. So you don't have to have a lot of um, editing skills in order to do this. Um, I'm going to pause any questions at this point before we get into some of the technical details about what you need to also invest in. Yes, yes, uh, this is Bob. I have a uh, friend of my son's who is a very good cartoonist, and I'm thinking about using him for cartoons all the way through from, from my stories on joy. And uh, he is very good. And uh, I'm really pleased with what he's doing. And I also, my editor lives in Japan. He's a retired English professor I've known for a long time. So we, I think I'm, those two areas, I probably, uh, one of the things I was thinking about for the cover was I'm 85 years old and I'm pushing a walker with a stack of, uh, of my past toys with the cover, the title on top of the walker. Oh, that'd be cute. Okay, right. that's, that's mine. <laughs> Any other comments, questions before we move on? I have a question. Um, sure. Um, I'm writing a, a memoir, mm -hmm. but the memoir is about the effects of family courts on, on, on children. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that my idea for the cover is um, a photo of when my sister, me, and my mom were, were younger, basically when my sister was a child. But the photo basically will have the... Um, where my sister is standing or where my sister is seated ripped apart ripped off mm -hmm. but i don't know if that would be appropriate for for the memoir um that would be entirely up to you and the content that you have in there so typically covers are vibey <laughs> like if you don't understand that word just go ahead and let me know um covers are very reminiscent of the content of what's happening in your book and so if that's something that's going to be a big thing um that separation of family i mean and then there's nothing wrong with that concept as a cover for you um if you're more concerned about actually doing that type of effect that's probably too advanced for a canva pro and book brush so you might have to learn how to um use a software like Photoshop or hire someone to do that for you. Um, the other thing that you'll have to be concerned about is different versions of books require different file sizes. And so depending on the dimensions of your image, you might have to add, um, you might have to like stretch it or add some type of other color block or framing to it in order for it to fit to a cover. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, Lisa put in the chat, can you talk about using beta readers and also how to find a reputable copy editor? Yeah, okay, so I'll just go back to that. Um, oh, that was a few slides ago. Okay, we'll just sit here for now. Um, so beta readers, my best way of finding them is actually my social circle already. Um, but I tend to be involved in a few writing communities. And so I am aware of who might I reach out to that has free time and has some experience with what I'm writing. Um, I tend to have um, use beta readers as someone to tell me, um, like for example, my middle grade novel, I all my beta readers were either children's librarians or friends who were teachers because they are people who have experience with those type of literature, they'd have an understanding of how a child might react to it. Um, so, but I didn't like necessarily go seeking them on the internet. They were people that I happened to know. Um, the other thing that you could do is not all of your beta readers have to be writers. Um, sometimes it's helpful because writers can tell you, this is what I felt and why, and that can give you some guidance onto what to change. But if you also just wanna say, hey, I tried writing a romance, 
you read a lot of romances, what clicks, what doesn't for you, then just someone who is familiar with that genre and the tropes would be a good beta reader for you as well. Um, the trick there though, obviously means to be selective about who you give your work to. Um, that's something that you kind of have to be aware of at any point in the editing process. Every book is not for every reader. So you wanna make sure that you're giving it to someone who can edit it for you, who um, has some understanding of your genre or age group. Um, and you wanna look at that when you're also looking for copy editors. Um, the best place for that, again, I would say is talk to any local writers who they might've worked with. Um, local Facebook groups is always something there. Um, there's also Readsy is a kind of an online marketplace. And so there's a lot of freelancers who work there that are in the publishing sphere. So content editors, um, copy editors, even artists who would create book covers, that would be a good place to start. And that's spelled R-E-E-D-S-Y. Anything else? Nope, all right, onward. All right, so the next thing is ISBNs. So ISBNs can be a little tricky, by which I mean, it kind of depends on what you want to do with your novel. Um, is it something that you want to publish wide? So in places other than Amazon, um, or is it something that you want to just live in Amazon and maybe in KU, so Kindle Unlimited? Um, do you think that you're only going to have eBooks? Do you think you're going to have an eBook and a paperback or an eBook, a paperback and an audio? Um, are you gonna have two versions of print, a large print and a regular print? Um, all of this is gonna kind of filter into your idea to have an ISBN. Um, ISBNs are what's used to identify a novel and they kind of link in the back end of the national book database, kind of like how every individual person has a social security number, every individual book has an ISBN. Um, they are federally, federally regulated. There's only one place in the, in the US where you can actually buy them. And it's from a place called, uh, I don't actually know if it's pronounced Booker or Bowker. I've never heard it said, just, I just read it all the time. Um, but it's the only place legally in the States where you can buy it. Um, that doesn't mean sometimes places like Amazon doesn't give it away for free. They buy it in such bulk quantities. It's cheap for Amazon to give away ISBNs, but you only want to accept an ISBN from a publisher in select situations. Um, so Amazon isn't the only person who can give you an ISBN. Um, any digital publisher tends to do that. So um, Kindle, Kobo, Barnes and Noble Press, um, Draft to Digital, Smashwords, they will all give you an ISBN if you want one. Um, but that ISBN is going to be very specific to the version published with that publisher. So if you have an ebook and you want it for sale on Kindle and on Nook and on Kobo and on Google Books, you have to use the same ISBN. In that case, you have to buy it yourself. And then every time you're building an ebook, you have to put in that identification number. Um, the more you buy at a time, the cheaper it is per ISBN. It definitely has that economies of scale. So it's $300 for 10 ISBNs or $575 for 100 ISBNs. So that price like really drops the more you get, but a lot of people don't have that type of money to invest up front. Um, totally understand that. Um, but sometimes that buy, uh, that bulk buy does make sense because once again, you need a different ISBM per version. So um, for my middle grade um, novelette, for example, I have both a print version and an ebook version, two separate ISBNs. And when I record that and have that as an audiobook, that's going to be a third ISBN. Um, so you have to be aware of what's getting assigned what. Um, I do have a few books where I didn't really care um, to have them go really wide, or I didn't really care to have the synergy that comes with the same ISBN, um, which is same metadata and same reviews, um, where I was okay with, okay, I could have an 
Amazon ISBN and I could have a Kobo ISBN, um, especially if they're like very single short stories. I don't care if they're treated separately, but then when I brought them together in a collection of all four short stories together, then it was one ISBN because then I could push it out wider. Um, questions? I know like ISBNs are kind of tricky and there's a lot of nuances here. No? All right. More questions. I put the link into the chat though. Uh, what, uh, what about nonfiction? Anything. Nonfiction, fiction, poetry, um, it has to have an ISBN. Is it, isn't that just, you have to have an ISBN if you want it sold in a bookstore or sold online. If it's just a private personal publication, there's no law that says you have to have an ISBN, right? Correct, yeah. But most of these places are going to require, like especially like KDP, is going to require that you put in an ISBN in order to build the book. The only place that I'm aware of that really allows you to kind of do those personal personal projects are going to be directly through a printer or actually Barnes and Noble Press will allow you to print personal projects. So if you just like one or two copies for you, you can do Barnes and Noble. Um, but I'll also admit like as I'm doing this, I, I am publishing books to sell. So I want an ISBN because I want people to pick up my stories and and pay for it. Sure. Any other questions? No, all right, we'll get into the meat of actually building this. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about metadata. Um, so when you're publishing your book, you're putting all of this data, um, all of this metadata about your book into the database. The ISBN is what says everything, uh, brings everything together. It's your ID number for the book, but there's a whole bunch of other data that ha that is beneficial to you to live in there. You have things that are required, your author name, for example, um, the title of your book, um, you kind of need that in there. Um, things that are also very useful are categories. Um, so is your book, um, an, like romance would be a category, nonfiction would be a category. Um, also sometimes the subgenres of categories, Amazon can get really in depth. Um, so for example, um, you could do US history, uh, World War II, um, and then the Northeast. So they can be pretty specific categories when you're going into there. There are some slight differences in categories between um, like Amazon or Drafted Digital or Kobo, um, but for the most part, they are the same. You'll also see slightly different categories when you're going um, internationally. So um, the categories that my book exists in in Canada, for example, are different than the categories my book exists in for uh, US. But when you're building your, your novel through like Amazon's American storefront, they'll translate it to what it might be in other markets for you, no problem. Um, the other thing to be aware of is going to be keywords. Um, so if you are writing a book of poetry, but it's all haikus, like haiku would be one of your keywords versus sonnets. Um, if you're doing a memoir, if it's a travel memoir, that would be a keyword versus um, something that might be autobiographical and cover essentially your entire life. So keywords are these little phrases that people would be typing in to find your book. Um, it's good to be aware of what these keywords are, maybe refresh them periodically, and you could find what they are a, a myriad of ways. Um, the other thing that's good to have in your meta metadata is the price of your novel, um, as well as the summary of your novel. Um, so where all of this kind of metadata can come from, from that shoestring option, just your mind, think about it. Like, here's my novel. What do I anticipate people to search that I want this to come up with. Um, if you have a romance that's about enemies to lovers, that might be one of your keywords. Um, if you have a science fiction that's a space opera, space opera might be one of your keywords. Um, you could look at the options that are coming up in the platforms that you wanna sell. So for example, um, in Amazon's just like search bar, you can start to type um, 
oh, if one of your keywords is let's go back to romance, you could say romance novels, and then you'll see probably four or five different options that drop down in the list, like the autocomplete. Those are going to be keyword phrases that people are searching a lot. Um, so they might be good keywords for your book because obviously there's traffic there. Um, and it's good to try that for a variety of places. Try that on Amazon, try that on Google, try that on um, Barnes and Noble, perhaps. Um, you could use a few SEO tools. SEO stands for search engine optimization. It's the same type of thinking. Instead of just optimizing a website or a blog post for Google, you're optimizing the data about your book for Amazon or any other site that might be selling it. Um, so you could also like do, do Google Trends. That's a, another place that you could look. Um, those are all free options. There is a balanced option called Publisher Rocket. Col Publisher Rocket is a software, it's $9, uh, $90, sorry, but it's a one-time fee. And what it actually does is it is a, um, it goes through and it pulls out a whole bunch of Amazon data. So you could search key, like a keyword phrase within the software. And what it will tell you is it'll give you a whole bunch of related keywords, but it will also tell you how competitive are those keywords, meaning how many other books are there, how many books you might need to sell in order to be in the first page of results, um, how much money the top seller has. And so if you, um, not everyone wants to write that way. Some people just want to write a story and put it out there. If you want to write to market, if you want advice on I, what categories or what keywords are currently hot might get you the most searches, Publisher Rocket would be the tool to do. Um, it only works for Amazon and there isn't actually a tool out there for other venues like um, like Indigo or Barnes and Noble or Kobo. So it's just Amazon, but Amazon tends to be the bulk of most book sales nowadays. Um, so anything that works for Amazon is most likely also to work for other places. Um, if you have money for that time is money option, you could hire an SEO specialist. So someone who will do all that research for you, <laughs> saving you the time. Um, there's also a website called PickFu. And what they'll do is they'll do polls. It's not something that you should probably do for everything, but if you have, if you're not entirely sure like what the summary of your book might be, you could run a poll. Say here is version A of my summary. Here is version B of my summary. Which one makes you more likely to buy the book? Um, PickFu will actually run that test for you. It's a minimum though of $50. Um, so probably not something that you wanna do when you're just starting out. Um, but as you're getting further into your career, you might have a little bit of extra cash. Um, or if you have a book that you might think that might've been on Amazon for two, three years at this point, you're like, it just needs a, a refresh. That might be a good way to put some more um, juice in it and bring it back up. Um, so the, the, the thing here is when you have the right metadata behind your book, when you're building it, it's just easier for people to find it. So that's what's going on here. Um, I feel like metadata also kind of gets into that tech heavy, might be new sphere for some people. So any questions? No, okay, no worries. All right, so formatting your book for ebook versions. Um, it's not that complicated to be fair. Um, as long as you have a doc file, docx, or even a PDF, most publishers will convert it for you. Um, so draft to digital will do that, Smash Words will do it, Kindle Direct Publishing, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Readsy, all of these people, you could just upload a file and they'll format it for you. Um, some of them even have custom formats, which is really cool. Um, I the I tend to use Draft Digital and Draft Digital and Smashwords. Um, I have them listed separately, but one actually bought the other earlier this year, so soon they will be the same company. Um, and what's kind of nice about them too is once you format a book with Draft Digital, you can just download it, format it the way you want it, and upload it to everything else. So you can say, okay, now I have this file, I'm just gonna upload it to Amazon. So then you could have the exact same formatting between Draft to Digital and Amazon um, versus slight differences between how Draft to Digital might have done it and KDP. Um, if you kind of want that balanced option, um, Vellum is a way where you can actually format your eBooks. So it's $250 for a lifetime subscription and it only works for Mac. 
Um, but something that Vellum does is it's a little more, little more advanced if you want to have images in your books. That's what Vellum would be really good for. So whether you want custom images before chapters, whether you're doing nonfiction and you want to have photographs or charts, um, if you want to have really fancy drop letters, if you want to have maps formatted in your books, those type of things are kind of where Vellum works well. Um, Atticus, um, I mentioned that one before, works as both a word processing software and an ebook formatter. So it kind of does double duty and that's 147 for life. Um, Atticus is actually a new software. I don't know much about it. It has been released in the past six months. Um, so people are still kind of learning it, figuring out what happens, but it's by the same company that made Publisher Rocket. Um, so by people who are also authors and they're kind of very invested in the author community. Um, of course, if you have the money for it, you could always pay someone to format your ebook for you. Um, might be helpful if you don't want to dish out for vellum. If you only want to publish one or two books, it might not be worth it to pay $250 for that. You could probably pay someone to format it for half the price of the software. Um, so that's how for the ebook. Um, this is kind of how it looks like for draft digital. So um, this was the text of my novel, I uploaded it, and then I had ways to change the formatting of it. So I could choose um, drop cap. So I have a phrase cap. So my first phrase is all capital letters, but I could have told draft to digital, well, just do the first word um, or don't do anything, just have it be the first letter. Um, I also had a beginning scene and decoration. Did I want an image here or not? I could choose that. Um, we also have different types of styles. This is a, a ghost story. And so I kind of wanted something a little creepy. And so I had a tree, but there were other options here for romance. You could have a little heart and a ribbon underneath your chapter title. Um, so very simple, but still cute and not just plain boring templates. And again, the only thing you have to do to get this is upload your Word document. And then you have all of these options at your fingertips. And, and excuse me, is this with something called Nevermore? Nevermore is the title of the template. Okay, but what company then is this whole thing? This called? is Draft to Digital. Pardon me, say that again? Draft to Digital. Oh, the D2, D2, D2 is Draft to Digital. Okay. Yep. So, and it is, um, it is this one right here. Yeah. And draft a digital, I'm, I'll actually walk you through the process live later this, this evening so you'll be able to see everything too. All right, and then um, anything else about ebooks? Otherwise, we're going to dive into print. All right, cool. Um, so, print. Um, if you want to do it cheaply, um, your only option, truthfully, is Kindle Direct. Um, Kindle doesn't charge you a fee in order to do um, print books. Um, and it's the same type of process. You can just upload your file and Amazon will be like, all right, tell me what color pages you want, what size you want it, and they'll format it for you. Um, many people, however, will also do Ingram Spark. So Ingram Spark costs you $50 to do it, 25 if you want to make an edit later. But why many people actually feel like Ingram Spark is worth the price is because through Ingram Spark, your paperbacks can be um, in independent bookstores and libraries. Um, so for, um, for, for Kindle, it really is relatively limited to Amazon's own sales uh, channels, but Ingram Spark is how it's going to be in the bookstore down the street. Um, it's how it's going to show up in Barnes and Noble or Target. Um, and I know, like, um, I'm, I actually live in Oak Park, so not Glen Ellen, but there's a bookstore down the street. I can go to my bookstore's website, put in my book, and order a copy. Um, they won't stock it in store, but they'll buy it for me, and I can pick it up. And it's because I've published through Ingram Spark, and they have connections to Ingram Spark's catalog. Um, Ingram Spark kind of has that online formatter to help you through things. Um, but it doesn't necessarily do anything fancy. So once again, if you want to do like photos or charts or maps, um, then you probably want to pay a formatter or you're going to want to do one of those formatting softwares like Atticus or Vellum. 
Um, here's kind of how it looked like with, um, with Ingram Spark. So they give me a PDF version. Here's how it looks. Here's all the dimensions. I don't know if you could see it. It's kind of tiny here, but it's like, okay, so my, um, my content is black and white. So no colored printing. My paper color was cream. I had 66 pages. My spine was um, just about 0.2 inches. Um, here's my back cover. Here's the name of my publisher. Um, here's the dimensions of the book, 4.2 by seven. Um, and so they'll give you all of the stuff that you could do as an e-proof, and then you could also get a physical proof so you could check it before you say, all right, bookstores, it's up for grabs. Um, this, though, is a slightly different dimension cover-wise than it is for an e-book, so be aware of that. That's one of the benefits, I would say, of designing your own cover. If you need to mess with the dimensions, you could do it pretty easily. Um, if you did have a custom made cover you can usually walk with an work with an artist and they can give you the different dimensions um if it's a pre-made cover it's going they may or may not give you the different dimensions um you might just have to be okay if it's too big or too small fiddle with some of the online um builders and have a trim in a corner on a size um so any questions here in terms of building your book? That's kind of where we're at. Um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, <clears throat> this is Marilyn Peretti. Um, I was involved in something recently where I was uh, offered or they wanted me to take over the editorship of, of uh, something. And um, it, it's an annual anthology. Anyway, they were go they had done it on Amazon before, and, and that program has turned into Kindle Direct Publishing, right? Uh, create Space is that what you're referring to? Create Space Art. turned into Create Space turned into KDP. Oh, I th all right. I thought yeah. it was uh, all right. Um, one thing I found out though, the reason I turned it down, I didn't want to get involved, was that there was absolutely no support. There was no uh, one that you could contact online and nobody that you could call. And even though I've laid out a lot of books and published some books, I didn't like the idea of working with a different company that I'd worked with before and not be able to ask any questions. <laughs> so that's a real drawback with the KDP. Yeah, and Ingram has the same thing. Um, what will really? really save? Yeah, Ingram will is Ingram. I find is way more responsible, uh, responsive on Facebook than like their own thing. Um, Amazon has a pretty extensive like help um, glossary indexed file, so they tend to send you to a lot of links, and they've got lots of details online that you could read through. But what will really save you is um, Facebook groups. So I'm part of a Facebook group that is only helping people get their books set up in Ingram, <laughs> um, for example, um, because any problem that you have, someone else has probably um, come across it and can help you through it. But that's something that the writing community, I mean, it's called a community for a reason, honestly. Everyone who is in it really tries to support each other, help each other, um, whether it's you know, being beta raters or cover designs or saying, hey, I went through the same problem, here's how I solved it. And what is the name of that group? Um, there are several, I actually have it on the appendix slide in here. So when you get the slides, you'll have them. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries, it's, it's, a, it's a question I've gotten before. <laughs> so. All right, any other questions about building your book for ebook or print? Oh, okay, so marketing your masterpiece. Once your book is out there, how can you get sales? And I understand not everyone might want to do that if you're just publishing it for personal reasons. But if you did, um, here's the ways that you could do it. Um, once again, promo images, and you could do this the same way that you did for creating your cover. Um, the shoestrings option would be the free versions of Canva, um, Paint.net, Gimp, Kitra. You could have Canva Pro. Pro, you could have a graphic designer if you have that money to do it. Um, these are things that I had done myself for my middle grade when it came out. So this will play. So you could do like a video that captured attention on Instagram. This is the dimensions for Twitter. Um, oh, they also 
Oh, sorry. I thought I had updated this with one of my TikTok videos. I'm now also on TikTok. So I have done um, videos of quotes with my, with my stories and then I'll have relevant images in the background for it. And I can actually create that in, um, in Canva Pro. Um, ways to promote your book are pretty basic. So the shoestring option is really just talk about it. Um, if you have social media, use that. Say, hey, look, I have a book. Here's what it's about. Here's when it's coming out. Here's where you can buy it. Um, you could do e-arcs. So what this is, is before your book comes out, you offer typically PDF versions of it in exchange for reviews. Um, sites like Book Sprout and Book Sirens. Oh, and you don't really want me over here. I'm so you don't want did you have a question? Oh, no. okay. Um, so sites like Book Sprout and Book Sirens are actually find you those readers if you don't have a dedicated reader base yet. So, um, and then you could say, I want readers of romance, I want readers of science fiction, and they'll find them for you. Um, you could do interviews. Um, so this is something that I personally am trying to get involved in, um, matching with podcasts and doing interviews with a podcast or two. Um, so I am doing one later this week, and then I'm going to do another one later this month. Um, so that's a new venue for me, but it's something that is pretty easy for me to get involved in. Um, I just say, hey, here's what I can talk about. And then it's up to the, the podcast host to say yes or no. <laughs> um, you can also do display ads. Um, so this is one of those things where the better your metadata is, um, the less likely you might need ads because if people can organically find your stuff, then hopefully you're not going to pay for traffic to get you there. Um, so how these typically work is you pay to either um, put so many thousands of ads in front of someone's um, on their computer um, or you pay per click. Um, I've, tr I've played a little bit with both Facebook and Amazon ads. I've had better luck with Amazon. But it's also one of those things where it can get away from you very quickly. So you should, especially early on, monitor it, make sure that it's worth the cost investment that you're putting in there. And if you only have a few books out, it's probably not a good option for you yet. Most people who are indie authors, they only start advertising once they have four or five books published. Um, and then if they have a series, they'll typically wait until book three has come out. And the reason for that is um, you're more willing, if, if people like the first book in a series and they're probably gonna go on and buy the second and the third and so on and so on. Um, so once it's easier and cheaper to get someone to get that read through than if you only have one or two sporadic books. Um, and so it just makes um, advertising more sustainable. Um, if you have that time is money option, you could pay someone to actually manage your ads for you if you want to. Um, but what a lot of um, other people will do will be those large promotions. Um, so this is something where a lot of people in the traditional space will play. So like Penguin Random House or Hatchet, they tend to do these more large promotions. And so they cost a lot of money. Um, BookBub is one of those email blasts. So let's say your, your Kindle book is usually $5.99 and now it's for sale for 99 cents for a weekend. So you could tell the entire book bug subscription, hey, this weekend only buy my book for 99 cents. But just to announce that sale is gonna cost you a couple hundred. Um, NetGalley, what happens there is you give, um, again, e-arcs, sometimes real arcs of physical copies of your books. And then people can say, yeah, I want one of the limited copies that you're doing in exchange for a review. Um, NetGalley is where a lot of, um, professional book reviewers actually will get their books from. So if you're seeing a book reviewed in the New York Times or in the Chicago Reader, they probably got it from NetGalley. But once again, that's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars to get in there. Um, Publishers Warehouse, same type of thing. So most, um, most indie authors won't do it. Um, they might do a BookBub because BookBub will also have subsets for audiobooks and for eBooks. Um, but it's one of those places where it's becoming harder and harder because the traditional publishers are driving the costs up a little bit. Um, and then 
also building the momentum. The best way to advertise a book is to put it in the back of a book that they've already read. Um, so um, ideally you want people to read just not one book from you, but you want them to read maybe one or two of the books that you've written, especially if you're doing a series. Um, and so at the very least, you should have an online presence so people can see everything that you might've published. Um, you can have author pages. Amazon allows you to build this yourself. Um, BookBub, even if you don't run promotions through them, you could have just kind of a profile of here's all the books that you have. Um, Goodreads is another one. Um, so where you can have all of your books kind of on Goodreads and then you can, and people can mark it as, oh, I want to read this one or here's what I thought about it. Um, but it's just as an author, don't read any of the comments you get. It's just not worth the trouble. Um, the other thing is actually back matter. So if you, if this is your second book that you released, one of the last pages in your book can be like, here's other books that I, you know, by the same author. And so they can see other things in an ebook. You can actually have those be links. So if someone bought a Kindle book from you and you have a list of other books that you've written, you could have a link and it'll take you, take them to that book on Amazon and then they could just buy it. Um, if you want to do a more balanced option, it's having author websites. Those do require a little bit of investment. Usually you have to pay for, um, like designing of it. Sometimes you have to pay for web hosting. I think I pay about 200 a year for my website. Um, so not a whole lot when you stretch it out, but not like a, a free thing either. Um, email lists, by which I mean having your own, but also you could pay to be promoted in someone else's email list, or you could do swaps. Um, writing a sequel, I've mentioned that before, a big way um, is to get those repeat readers is to have the next book in a series. Same characters, same plot. Um, sequels and series tend to have different terms. You'll have um, a series like Lord of the Rings where each book kind of builds on the plot of the previous ones. Or, or you will have um, sequels or series similar in like cozy mysteries. So each book is a new mystery, a new plot, but it's the same characters. Um, there is also, of course, custom websites. Those cost way more money than what I'm doing. I just bought a template hosting and I manage it myself. Um, custom websites would be um, very elaborate. They can cost a couple thousand. Um, and just for like examples, here is what, um, here's kind of what I look like on Amazon. So here's a selection of books that I have published or anthologies that I have been a part of. Um, and here's a screenshot of my homepage for my website. So here's um, my newest book, which is this anthology that I have, but then you could look and you could click and see here's everything I've done. Here's thoughts, which is essentially my blog. Here's um, my bio and some social media um, links and then how to contact me and sign up for my newsletter. So very kind of basic things, but this way when people are looking for me, they can find me and not just me, but also items that they might want to read. Um, so that's in the back, we'll just, we have kind of an understanding of the different publishers, Drop Digital, KDP, Kobo, um, and then reference slides. So places where you can, like, these are really good sites on how to publish um, and how to write. Ally is the Alliance of Independent Authors. So it's, um, you can either buy a membership or not, um, but there's always good resources that you could read there. They have a really good podcast, Kinderpreneur. This is the company that made Publisher Rocket now Atticus. They also have very helpful blogs and YouTube videos. Here's some of the Facebook groups, Why for the Win. Um, so that's specifically for people who want to publish beyond Amazon. That's just kind of industry lingo. If you're publishing wide, you're publishing not just to Amazon, you're publishing to any other partner. Um, 10 Minute Novelists is all writing support. Um, that Ingram Spark author community is where working with Ingram and how to promote books, how to build books. Um, within TikTok, if you want to get into that, TikTok tends to, is right now the up and coming social media specifically for authors. There's been several indie authors who had like a video go viral and had their books kind of like get mass bought by Barnes and Noble. Um, and always, of course, look for your local author community. Um, I'm part of a local writers group, I think I mentioned before, that does do things with Glenn Ellen from time to time. Um, NaNoWriMo is something that's still many months away because that's every November. <laughs> um, but there's always something, I'm sure. 
Um, coming up soon, actually the American Writers Museum, which is downtown in Chicago, they're having a virtual, um, like a virtual conference and it's free. So you could just sign up for that on the museum's website and there'll be a whole bunch of author talks that you can do um, and just meet other writers that way. Um, any, any questions? And if not, could you show the previous slide? It had sort of a chart, and that was only up there a short time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, what did you? What, what can you say about this? So these are the different publishers. So Draft to Digital is um, ebook at this point. Print is work in progress. So okay. it's something that they're trying to develop. So soon they'll be a competitor to Amazon KDP, but that's something that isn't out yet. It's only in beta. Um, it's free to publish with them. And typically what the royalties you would get from the ebook is you would get 60% of the sales price. Um, the distribution is aggregate uh, um, to Econ Place plus international. So not only would it be sending your book to, um, you know, like target.com or IndieBound or something, but it'll also send you to like Albertsons, which is Australia's bookstore. Um, and if you, they do have advertising that you could run through them. KDP, Amazon will do ebook, um, paperback and hardback. It's free to do it with them. Um, the royalties that you get for an ebook are 35 or 70%. It depends on the price of your ebook and whether or not you're enrolled in KU. Um, so KU is at Kindle Unlimited. If you are in KU though, you cannot publish it elsewhere. So it is Amazon and Amazon only. That's why when you're publishing wide, um, you're, it's other places as well. Um, but they're really only distributing to Amazon's websites. Amazon owns probably a lot more than you think they do. So like Better Books is Amazon, Goodreads is Amazon. Um, Ali, um, um, th there's a few other bookstores that like, oh, look, it's cheaper than Amazon, but it's really just Amazon utter cutting themselves. <laughs> Um, but they will do deals and display ads that you could do if you're publishing through them. Kobo is ebook only. It's free to publish with them. Your ebook royalties for this are actually 70. Um, so it's their own store that they'll publish books to. They'll also do it to IndieBound and they'll do it to select foreign markets. draft digital and Kobo have different deals with, in, with international markets. Um, you can do advertising with them. Ingram Spark is... Um, ebook, paperback, and hardback. It costs you $50 to, to um, publish with them. Blank royalties because it really varies. Ingram works as a printer many times. So what ends up happening is you could say, you can determine, um, so what, what it is is Ingram will make your book available and it ends up to stores to actually buy it. But you could say, here's the wholesale discount that I want to offer stores. You can say you want to offer stores a 55% discount, a 45% discount, or a 35% discount. And then depending on that, you're going to have um, in the printing costs of your book um, and an income fee, you're getting um, whatever proceeds that you're getting. Um, so it, it varies depending on a few things, what your royalties are going to be for your books. Um, but that will distribute to stores, to libraries. You can advertise through their catalog. Um, draft to digital is how I get into Hoopla and Overdrive. So um, that's also library. But that's where the apps come into play here. Um, most independent authors are doing a combination of KDP, Ingram Spark, and Draft to Digital. Um, sometimes they'll go direct to Kobo. Through Draft to Digital, you can actually publish to Kobo, but it's that little bit of extra royalty if you want to go through the process of doing it direct. Um, so some people do it, some people won't. It depends on how much time they want to spend to managing it. All right. Okay, thanks. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Any other questions? No, not me. No, all right, cool. I'm gonna well, stop someone, sharing. Mm -hmm. I was just Hi. gonna say someone asked in the uh, chat if we, are sending the recording out and yes, I will send the recording, the slides um, and any links we shared um, in an email to everyone. So if you miss something, you'll get it again. <laughs> no worries. And I'm stopping my share so I can just get out of the PowerPoint. And then I'm gonna walk you through Canva Pro and we're gonna make a cover real fast and then we'll offload it to draft to digital So this will be like a fake thing. It's not something I'm actually going to publish and have available for sale because it's not, um, quite ready for it yet, but the process is going to be the same, and so you'll be able to see that. So let me just get everything arranged here.
Um, da, 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 da. All right, and we're just gonna, I think I can reshare now everything all set. Let me know when you see this, you should see Canva Pro. See it. Blue banner, yeah, okay. So this is Canva Pro. So you can see like there's a, a variety of different things that you can do. Um, what we're going to be mock publishing today is going to be uh, a short story anthology of science fiction stories. Um, but I just want to do really fast. I want to look, I want to make a book cover. So let's see what type of covers we have on book cover. So um, through Canva Pro, I have options of a few things that I might want to do here. So let's say because this is a science fiction book, I actually like the background on this one. So I'm gonna use this as a start. Um, you obviously wanna tailor it. You want your book to be unique. You wanna make sure that you're just like copy right exists of text, copyright can also exist for images. So you wanna make sure things are unique. Um, so I'm gonna start off by, of course, changing this one. I'm just gonna put my name here. Um, and I am going to call this, um, Very, very basic because this is just a mock thing. I would think of my title way better than what this is right now. So the science of fiction, just to do it um, for the sake of this. Um, ideally, I would also do, um, I would Google any type of title that I would be considering because I want to make sure it's not a title that someone else has already used or if it's a title that might be hard to find in searching. Um, I was part of an anthology last year who, um, what they ended, they wanted the, the theme was three. So every story in the anthology had some symbolism, symbolism with three in it. Um, so they wanted to call, call it the book of three. But when we kept searching the book of three in Amazon, we would get weird, um, CDs. So like music. And we also found it would bring us um, book three of many series because Amazon was treating this as a broad search for, versus an exact search. So we ended up having to change the name of it. So you always want to make sure that you're doing some of those um, some of those searches. And I actually, I don't really like this at all. So I, all right. So I actually don't like how this is looking to display as a cover. I want something that looks really pretty. Um, so let's change this. Let's just say, um, to beyond is a is the title of a sci-fi anthology. Um, so there we go. Um, this doesn't scream very sci-fi for me, so I'll get rid of that. This background is okay, I think. Um, do I want to change it? Maybe. No, I don't like that anymore. So I'll undo that. Um, many things that are in here, there's a lot of like, um, there's a few cyberpunk stories in this. So I am going to search cyberpunk. And actually, I really like this, this cover here. So you can see here, this, the symbol that I'm hovering over where it says pro, that means if I didn't have a pro account, I would have to pay to use this image. But since I have a pro account, I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to drag it here and I'm going, I'm going to replace my background image with that new one because I just think it looks better. We're going to make this smaller to beyond. And if I want to lean into this cyberpunk feeling, I'm also going to change what it looks like, the text. So let's do something that's a little more no, I don't quite like that one either. Let's do, um, I want a sans serif font because that had been designed Ooh. for use on screen. Let's try this one. 
Mm, also not super nice. Duh, let's say, let's try this one wide medium. Close enough, okay. And I'm gonna make this smaller so it'll actually fit. So let's do 200 as a font size. Still too big, all right. We might have to bring this down to 150. And let's go even smaller so I can have it all be on one line. There we go. Um, I'm going to make my name the same font. So this is, um, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that, a grandier maybe. <laughs> um, and then, but I'm gonna have my current one be the same one. Here we go. That way I've got some synergy between the different elements of my book. Um, I am going to make this just a little bit bigger and just to kind of show you how you might be able to do it. I'm also going to add another element here. So let's add a box. Um, and we will have a very, um, actually I want a rectangle. Let's do a rectangle. So now I'm going to bring a rectangle here and I'm actually going to change the color. I want it to be something similar-esque to what might be here already. So I'm trying to match this kind of pink glow that we have here. Let's see if I can get there. Um, not quite the same. Let's fade it a little bit. All right, and then I'm gonna stretch this just a little bit. And now I'm gonna put my name here and I'm going to make it actually, still think that's really big. Let's just do a small box. We'll put my name here and we'll center it. And we're gonna make my name just a little bit smaller so it will fit and we'll make it black. Um, one of the other elements that comes with Canva Pro is um, some of the editing features. So if I'm also going to do, um, let's go back to Cyberpunk here. Let's see what I have. I've got photos. Um, I have graphics. Um, I have videos if I wanted to do that. Let's actually go back to photos. I want a cyberpunk, um, let's say goggles. Um, uh, not exactly what I had been thinking, but I'm gonna take this one and I'm just gonna, um, I don't want it be, to be a background image. I just want it to be small here. Um, but in Canva Pro, I'm actually going to now edit this. So this is something that I'm able to do with the Pro subscription. That's what this kind of little crown here means. So I'm going to remove the background of this image. So now I just have the, go the goggles, that white background disappeared. And I'm going to shrink this and just lay it here. I want to not make it be as white because this novel cover so far is very dark. Um, so let us make it, um, where are all of my possible filters here? Let's make it kind of, let's, let's add this kind of peony overlay. There we go. So now it's kind of the same colors here. So this is just very basic, um, kind of how you can manipulate things in, in Canva. You could do a variety of stuff for it. If I wanted to, um, to start animating this, um, there are ways that I could do that as well. Um, there are ways to build charts. You can add audio, um, create, a variety. You can even create QR codes in here if you wanted to do that. Um, but just for the sake of tonight, this is going to be our cover. Um, 
And now I am going to, I'm done. So I don't want to share this, but I do want to download it. Um, so I am going to rename this um, mock cyberpunk. There we go. Don't want anything else here. And let me download this now. Here we go. So I'm going to download it as, um, as a JPEG, but there's many ways that you would be able to download this. Um, and I want it to be very large and I want the quality to be high. Pro allows you to change these download settings. If you didn't have a pro set account, you would be restricted into how um, and what you could download. So I'm going to have that download. All right, now we're gonna switch over to draft to digital So draft to digital is that digital publisher that I was talking about. This is the aggregate. So when you're publishing things here, um, it's going to push out pretty much everywhere you can think of it doing. Um, also really easy to format books here. All right, so we're going to add a new book. Um, front cover. All right, I have this because we just made it and downloaded it. Um, where is this? Downloads. All right, so while that's trying, oh, I won't be able to do anything while that window is still open. But you can see these are the type of things that it's going to ask me for. What the title of my book is, is it part of a series, publisher, um, something that I do personally because I have two pen names and I write across many things. In addition to having those two pen names, I also have two publishers. Um, so I have one publisher name that I tend to use for my middle grade stuff and then one publisher name that I have for um, my more like contemporary adult um, items that I do. Um, come on, Windows, let me see all my downloads. Um, here we go. All right, so here's that mock uh, cyberpunk cover. So that's gonna flow. So here we call this to beyond. Um, this is not a series. The publisher is actually going to be, um, this would be Libra Chai. Um, that's my author um, search term. So what do I want? This is kind of that metadata that I was talking about before. What do I imagine people searching for this book would use? So I would say um, cyberpunk. I would say short stories, um, science fiction, short reads, um, science fiction anthologies, um, futuristic tales, and so on. Um, these are those categories that I had mentioned before of and they're, they're a little different between like draft to digital and Amazon, but Many of these are nonfiction, antiques and collectibles, architecture, art, Bibles, business and economics. I am, I'm gonna filter here. So I'm gonna do um, science fiction. It'll help me find what I'm looking for. Um, so I'm going to go here now under, um, where is fiction? That should be here, fiction. Um, and then so under fiction, I have science fiction, and it would be um, collections and anthologies would be one of the categories. Cyberpunk would be another category. Um, and then I'm also going to say, I don't have any time travel, but there's one story that has space exploration. So there we go, start ebook. Um, so I am going to upload um, a manuscript here. Um, I am going to just come up with a fake release date. 
Um, so I'm going to say the six, uh, most books actually come out on Tuesday. So let's say it's going to come out next Tuesday, the 12th. Um, so you could do whatever you want. You could have your book come out today. And then as soon as it's done processing through draft to digital, your book would be available for sale. If you instead want to do like pre-orders and kind of do some hype and buzz for it, you're welcome to. And you just say, okay, your book is going to be released um, anytime later. That processing time that draft to digital has is about 72 hours. So even if you're say mm, published today, it will slowly be rolled out to all of these other places as it comes out. Um, sometimes it's kind of cool. Um, when I first published a book through them, like I felt like every couple hours I was getting an email like, oh, your book is now on, on a Kobo. Oh, your book is now on Albertson. There's like, oh, it's so cool. Now it's on Google Books. Um, and you'll actually get the same type of emails, even if you have it as a pre-order, um, because they'll populate it into the system, but then they won't actually send out the files until the day of your release. Um, so for here is um, ebook description. We're just gonna do um, short stories of a cyberpunk nature. Um, featuring the dangers and perils of internet addiction. That's not everything that's in here, but it is what it is. Um, you're seeing all my, um, this is Grammarly. I use Grammarly for everything. So I have it in Firefox. I have it actually in Word. So I could run things through my Microsoft Word um, application. It works out great. Um, so we'll just have a very brief description here. Actually, I think it needs to be at least 50 characters. Um, so spanning um, what could be tomorrow to the um, destruction of Earth um, during attack based um, protagonists as they prepare for the future. Some I would I would put more thought when I would actually be publishing this, but just for the sake of getting this out the door. Um, so something that you could do here, and I think um, who was it, Marilyn, who was talking about doing um, group projects, draft to digital would allow you to have paid collaborators. So if you and someone co-wrote a book, or if you're putting together an anthology and there's 10 different authors, draft to digital will automatically split any of the royalties between it, between everyone who contributed. Um, if you're selling through like Amazon or Ingram, you have to actually do all that math yourself. But draft to digital will just do it right off the bat. Um, here is kind of what I talked about before in terms of ISBNs. Because draft to digital is a publisher, they can't sell you an ISBN, but they can give you one for free because they buy them in such bulk. It probably costs them half a penny to buy it. Um, they don't care if they just give you one for free. Um, but if you're going to have this book, um, if you're going to publish it, not just through ISBN or through Draft to Digital, but you also then want to take it to Amazon or some other partner where you want to go direct. Kobo, for example, because on Kobo, you get a slightly higher royalty if you go through them and not Draft to Digital. Then you would want to say, I want to use my own ISBN, and you would have to drop in the ISBN that you bought from Boker. Um, otherwise, if you don't care about having all of that linked, you can just say Draft to Digital, just give it to me, and they will. Um, so depending on what you want to do, um, you can choose either option. Um, I'm going to, I don't have one, but ideally when this gets published, it would have its own ISBN because I would publish to both, um, both here and Kobo Direct. Um, but for the sake of going through this, I'm going to just hit save and continue. Um, and then we'll go into um, the layouts. Um, so I am going to ask, um, so here are all of the, um, I, I low-key pre-formatted this. So this is something that you will have to do. Um, headers in your Word document, when you format them as a header in Word, 
it then tells software like draft to digital oh this is a new chapter or in this case for an anthology oh this is a new short story um i already have a title page in here so i'm not going to ask draft to digital to do it but draft to digital will make a copyright page for me like i don't have to make one they'll just do it for me it's lovely um, they will also do also buy because I have, I'm going to have this at the end of the book, um, because I have also done other books with draft digital. We'll just make that list for me. It's great. Um, and then if I don't have it filled out with draft digital, but I could also have an about the author page or an about the publisher page. Um, so they'll just do it for me automatically. Um, so I am going to do save and continue. And now this is essentially the website formatting my ebook for me. Um, so it's pretty fast to do this. Um, like if you, like we built, we started making a cover at eight o'clock. So it's gonna take us roughly 30 minutes to publish a book. So the actual process is not as complicated as you think it is. Um, okay, so here we go. Here is the different steps of, a, of, of what I might want to do. So this is the copyright page that they made for me. Um, so this is a work of fiction. Um, to be honest the title, here's the first edition copyright written by me. Um, here is an image that I had in here. Here is a title page. Here is a second um, copyright because this is mine. <laughs> this is the copyright page that I actually had in that, in that file. Okay, that's what's happening here. But I actually had, like I made logos for all my publishers. And so I have in, an embedded image in my Word file and it popped up here in my ebook file. So this is still here. You can do some of those small things, but it's really just like centered. That's the extent of what you can do versus like maps that you might want to have against justified with text. Um, here's my table of contents. So I could click here and it will take me to that story. Um, and now because we said that this is science fiction, I want it to be, let's say hardline. So now all of my chapters are actually going to have this kind of little design element to it. Or maybe I don't like that one. Maybe I want to do a digital FO. Okay, let's do that one. I could change the drop caps. So do I want a phrase? None. Um, it's just the letter here. Um, phrase, none. Um, so I just want just that first letter. That actually looks fine to me. And then I can go through here. I'm like, okay, how did this work? Oh, all of my... All of my line breaks now also have this. Do I like that? I don't know. Um, how did it, how would it look if I actually went back to this hard line? Oh, I think that one looks better. So let's go with that. Um, I don't think I like this really big capital letter for anything other than the first one. So let's say none. It's always going to be that same. Um, and then none, or let's just this should be it here. So now I have that drop cap at the beginning of the chapter or the short story but it's not there for any other extra extra thing. So pretty pretty easy to go around here. And then I can go all the way back down to here's about the author. So here's this, here's my hyperlink that you could stick in here. So if you click here, it would take you to what is essentially a link of everything that I have. So I, I put like, I was advertising this workshop. So when I talked about it on social media, people could just go here and click and sign up. Um, here is my most recent, novel that they can shoot, or this is an anthology that they can do with my website, Amazon author, social media page, but that is something that I embedded in my ebook. Pretty easy to do here. Um, here's And here's the thing that it made for me. Here's my, here's the other book that I have published through Draft Digital. Um, here's this one. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how that looks right now. Um, they do have separate templates for nonfiction. So just so people can see how that looks like, um, let's go to um, let's go to this one. Um, so you can have a D&D block. So this is what a nonfiction look, might look like. Here's what a textbook for poetry. They also have ideas for that. So you can do a modern watercolor. So they'll have like colored images in your formatting if you like that. Maraschino is a like really Victorian kind of curly cues obviously doesn't work for a science fiction anthology, <laughs> but it is what it is. So I'm going to go back to this hard line because I do kind of like the look of that. Um, you want to, this is when you're reviewing things. So you want to make sure that this all works. So 
I don't actually like this copyright page because I forgot I have one that I made myself already. So I can go back um, to step two, the layout, and I'm gonna tell them, don't do a copyright page. I'm gonna hit save and continue. And while we're waiting for that, I have two questions in the chat. Sure, go for it. Uh, the first one is, you have published several books. What has been your cost for each? Oh, it has varied. Um, so I have, like I said, I have quite a bit. Um, for, for my middle grade, my middle grade was the most um, expensive and the most expansive. Um, my middle grade right now is the only one I have out that's in both ebook e and print. Um, so it cost me um, $50 to have it go through Ingram Spark. And then I had to pay um, for the ISBN fees. So it was because I bought 10 and, uh, uh, for 300, so it ended up being $30 in ISBN. So that means my total costs for that book were the 50 plus 60. So just about $110 um, to publish that. Has it earned out yet? No. <laughs> um, but um, that is a book that I'm hoping to turn into a series. So long-term, I'm hoping that it would end up sell. Um, and the more books you have, the, you know, the more it's just gonna work. Um, book two for that is already drafted and written. So now I'm just in the editing stages for that. But did the cover for that myself, ended up doing um, the editing myself, but again, like through my beta readers who were either children's librarians or teachers. So I had a lot of input into it. Um, I have had feedback from kids who really liked it um, to the point where I, uh, I bribed a child to give me like very detailed ideas of like, what do you like and what do you want in the second book? And in the return, he has a character named after him. <laughs> so he's all excited for it. Um, so that's that one for things that I have done ebook only. Um, some of them I didn't bother with an ISBN because they were very experimental for me. So all it was the cost wise was the Canva Pro subscription, $12. Um, so, and I use that to make the cover. Um, and then I have a few, um, books where it's kind of in progress. So um, the anthology that I mentioned before, the, the one with the spaceship on it, uh, Tomorrow and Beyond. Um, I'm experimenting with, right now, it's actually in KU. Um, so I'm trying to see if that might be like a better business for me. If it's not, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, because right now it's just digital in KU, and then take it wide later and see what happens with that. And then I would also do print. Um, and in that case, I'd probably have to spend more money through Ingram Spark. So that'd be another $50. Um, and another 60 for the, for the cover or for the ISBNs. Um, so it's like 100 ish per book. Um, if you're doing two versions, ebook and print, and then creating the cover yourself. Oh. Um, and then there was another question. Yeah. Uh, real quick. We're a little bit over time, but, um, who sets the price your books will sell at? Me. Um, there is some variation to it. Um, and so we'll actually, you could see it right here. Like that's the next step for this. Um, so I have reviewed this manuscript. I approve it for release, um, save and continue. The next step is actually figuring out the pricing for this. Um, so, and how you want to do it. So because this book is about 20,000 words, I'm going to set it at, um, 299. Um, so it's probably a little high, um, but it's one of those things too, where like inflation has hit and everything a book at 20, like two years ago, probably would be selling for 199, but you're seeing book prices slightly increase. Um, but I'm going to say, all right, I want to sell it to all digital stores. I can, I can tell draft to digital because it's an aggregator, send it to all of these or send it to none of these. And at my price of $2.99, this is my projected royalty per sale. If I set it at $1.99, this is what I would get. Um, so I can choose what that is. There are, of course, our standards. Like you usually don't see eBooks for sale for $2.50. It's usually that $0.99 cent 
bucket. So 199, 299, 399. As you get up into some higher things, um, you might start to see like 650. Um, so I um I have a romance coming out next month actually with a small press. And so they set their prices actually kind of at like that 50 cent mark sometimes depending on word count. Um, but it is set based off of that versus anything else. Um, something else that I could do here is I can say, um, I could tell them to submit or not submit to Amazon. Um, but if I'm about to submit it on Amazon, they're making sure that I'm not publishing it directly. Um, and that I cannot, um, and then Amazon has like a lot of extra controls about this, even if you're going through draft to digital So many people who are publishing with draft to digital don't actually do it. Um, but go directly through KDP. Um, subscription services, so Scribd. Um, some people may be familiar, some people may not, but it's kind of like KU. Um, so you just, spe uh, Kobo has its own subscription service. So it's like $10 a month, but then you could read anything that's in the library. Um, and then, so Co Kobo Plus is their subscription thing. So um, because I'm distributing to Kobo, I also wanna say distribute to Kobo Plus, which will get me into all of these locations. Library services. So I can set a separate price for library books. They usually recommend something higher, which I think is always a little weird. Um, I don't know, Janine, if you know the, the reasoning behind some of that. I do, I actually. Uh, the reason behind that is um, because not just one person will be reading the book, multiple people will read that book. So you set it at a higher price because the library is sharing it with so many other people. Fair, there we go. Um, and we, then I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we have another question, but continue what you're doing. Oh, okay. um, and then through library services, and you could say the price for that. And then here are all the different library systems that this can now feed into. And again, like these library systems, if you wanna be in there, um, you can't do that through Amazon. That is something that you have to be doing through um, like draft to digital. Um, Kobo won't really do it either. It's based off of the partnerships that Draft Digital has made with these services. Um, Smashwords has access to Scribd, um, so this one, but because Draft Digital and Smashwords are merging, like you might as well just go with Draft Draft Digital. It has the better, I think, ebook formatting. Um, you are able to manage territorial prices. So if I want to, like, so in Australia, if I they're recommending it's $3.99, but I can say, well, maybe I actually want to charge $4.99 in Australia, in, in Canada, $3.99. Okay, Great Britain. Um, I might want to drop this to $1.99 because they tend to do the same type of thing, those 99 cent price points. Um, so then you could do that. You could do, you could um, naturally, it's going to give you the conversions. Um, you could do it individually, apply territories, and there you go. If you're publishing print, like through Ingram Spark, and you're trying to figure out your prices for that, Ingram will actually tell you um, what is the price to print your book. The standard that a lot of authors tend to do is you, depending on the book, you'll make more money from the ebook. So in this case, you could see like at $2.99, my royalty for this book from like most of these places is going to be about $180. Typically, what a lot of authors do for print books is they set um, their, their royalties to be a dollar per paperback book because print is so expensive. Um, if you give yourself much more, you might be pricing yourself out of the market. Um, so that's, and then you also are giving steep discounts to these publishers. So what happens is through Ingram Spark, if I'm saying Ingram, allow my book to be offered at a 55% discount to wholesalers, well, that 55% 50, 50, uh, 55 discount is coming out of my royalty. It's not coming out of printing costs. It's not coming out of um, like Ingram Spark's cut. It is a deep into my profit. And you have to offer that wholesale discount in order for a bookstore to pick it up. So um depending on the price of it is to print your book, you'll probably want to just give yourself a dollar, maybe dollar fifty profit per paperback. But that's going to be, but you can set that yourself based off of what the printing costs are. Any, Any other questions? questions? 
Yes. <laughs> um, so we actually have two more questions. Uh, the copyright office requires two copies of the finished book and a form filled out and a fee. Do you do that or does the publisher do that? Neither. So, okay. Um, oh, back to my undergrad days. Um, I really liked intellectual property. Um, so as soon as you publish something, it's yours. The copyright is yours. Anytime you write a blog post, as soon as you put it up online, that copyright is yours. Um, it is very easy to get a copyright. The benefit of doing all of that process and submitting it to the copyright office is then you have that proof of record, which is what you need in case you want to like protect your copyright in a court of law. Um, so all of these books that I have uploaded, they are copyright me. You just kind of put that C and in, in, in there it is. Um, but if someone were to um, pirate it and then publish it just under a different pen name, it would be harder for me to say, hey, this is mine if I don't have that set up through the copyright off office, give them the copies and pay the fee. Most authors won't do it because it is an extra expense. Like I shared before, it cost me a little more than $100 to publish a book. And I'm probably not going to recoup that cost in the first year of publication. Um, my audience is just too slow, a lot or too small, especially because I'm still new at this. I've been publishing for less than a year, um, writing for much longer, you know, but uh, just kind of uh, did this. Um, so with the book that I'm having come out with a small press publisher, they are going to be the ones who are doing that. But for things that I've independently published myself, no, and I'm probably not going to do it. It's just too much effort. Um, maybe I will do it in the future, but not right now. And our last question so far, uh, what kind of fee does draft to digital charge per copy sold? Zero. Ooh. So, uh, well, kind of, by, by which I mean, draft to digital, it takes a, a por portion of each sale. So unlike like Ingram Spark, where you have to pay $50 to even like go through their system, to actually use draft to digital system is free. So, and even right now, like I, I'm not gonna hit submit because that would like put it in the queue to actually be published, but I don't have to go through the whole thing either. Draft to digital has no problem with me stopping here at this preview page. Um, and downloading the file. So if I just want like a personal ebook of my book, right here, I can download the Mobi, I can download the EPUB, I can download the PDF and I could just share it with my friends and draft to digital doesn't care. Um, how draft to digital makes its money is it is a portion of every sale. So it is 10% um, of every sale they get. Um, but that means at the end of the day, you're getting the bulk of, bulk of it. So I think it ends up being 60% of the list price goes to you. It's so much more than traditional publishers will give you. <laughs> yes, yeah, even with um, even with a small press because it's, it's a digital for a small press, but it's not nearly as good as a benefit. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons, so like doing it yourself and not doing it yourself. Um, royalties is definitely one of it. Um, you get more when you indep independently publish, but all of the costs associated with it um, get eaten by the, or get absorbed by the publisher if you're going, whether traditionally or through a small press like I am. Any other questions? I think those are all of our questions. Thank you so much. Right. Awesome, of course. I'm, I hope you all learned something. I'm <laughs> gonna stop the recording now. <laughs> So, um,